Welcome to Backyard Professor videos on Mormonism, Mormon history, Mormon philosophy, and Mormon doctrine. This is my first in a very long series I am projecting I will produce. And earlier today, on today is November 2nd, Thursday, 2023, and I made a short on the idea of polygamy. And so I've had that on my mind all day long. And what I said in that short, uh, not sacred, not secret, sick. And so that's gelled in my mind throughout the course of the day. Let me show you what I mean when I say that, because polygamy is one of the worst problems, but specifically how Joseph Smith dealt with those women who confronted him and said, stick it where the sun don't shine, dude. Don't ever insult me like that again. And then Joseph Smith's heinous, irreverent, unprophetic, and damning, wicked, sinful practice of smearing every woman who rebuffed him and refused him. That is not the kind of man I praise, even if he thinks he communed with Jehovah. So, in Richard Bushman, and I think he caught the spirit of it, Rough Stone Rolling, in his book, Rough Stone Rolling. Uh, let's see here, page, I'm on page 441 here. In 1838, when Joseph, Joseph was accused of a relationship with Fanny Alger, which he was caught, and at first he denied, and then other witnesses against him showed up. And he finally had to confess to Emma that, yes, it was true. Please forgive me. And they all forgave him. But Joseph Smith was an adulterer with a very young girl, Fanny Alger. He was sealed to her before he even admitted receiving the so-called, quote, priesthood sealing keys in 1836. He was sealed to many other women before before he was actually sealed to his first wife, Emma Smith. Now, talk about a loving man, right? Yeah, right. Well, his only concern had been to insist that he had never confessed to adultery. So in his mind, apparently, this chump named Joseph Smith thinks that if I don't confess adultery, then I didn't can admit it. I didn't do it, so I'm innocent. See, this, this is warped thinking as far as I'm concerned, right? The written revelation on marriage actually noted that ye have asked concerning adultery and defined precisely what constituted adultery, and the question obviously bothered Joseph Smith. So Joseph explained to Nancy Rigdon. Now, this is the daughter of Sidney Rigdon, who was one of the counselors in the first presidency with Joseph Smith. Nancy Rigdon was his daughter, who refused Joseph's proposal of marriage, how he justified the apparent breach of the moral code. Here's what he wrote to Nancy Rigdon, the very famous happiness letter that every church leader since then has quoted without ever giving the historical circumstances that it was a letter of seduction written to Nancy Rigdon. They never give you the full context. Of course not. Nobody in Salt Lake City ever gives the full context. This is not the history you have ever been taught in seminary, institute, or any of the meetings in church. But this is what happened. Now, this is a faithful Mormon historian, Richard Bushman. He's still very much within the church, right? even though there are some conservatives who are mortified with him restoring the lost parts of the church history that the church so heinously has excised and has been hiding for centuries, now it's all coming back. Here's what he says. The path to happiness, he assured her, was virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. Notice what he puts last because he is priming her. Joseph Smith, the primer par excellence of underage girls and other men's wives. That is what he was. If the Mormons want to call him a prophet, seer, revelator, translator, and add any other amount of titles, that's fine. But he's also a primer 
to seduce. That is one of the titles he should have to wear. So even in taking additional wives, he had to think himself as virtuous, but the phrase about keeping the commandments of God suggested how plural marriage was justified. Now listen to this. See if you agree with this. God said, thou shalt not kill. At another time, he said, thou shalt utterly destroy. What was a believer to do with the conflicting injunctions? Joseph reached a terrifying answer. And I will explain why this is a terrifying answer, because of the way the church was set up by, guess who? Yes, Joseph Smith himself. That which is wrong under one circumstance may be and often is and often is right under another. This unnerving principle was the foundation of the government of God because whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is, he wrote Nancy, although we may not see the reason thereof till long after the events transpire. Okay, so. Bushman continues on page 442, the idea actually informed every revealed religion. A few years later, the Christian evangelist and anti-slavery advocate Charles Finney, who was very popular then, was to say with respect to slavery that no human legislation can make it right or lawful to violate any command of God. To Finney, the higher law, the equality, is what prevailed over human law and justified attacks on slavery. So the same sentiment coming from Joseph Smith with plural marriage in mind froze the heart. You see, nobody talks about this except the honest historians, right? He could not have chosen words better suited to strike terror into the rational mind. Now, Bushman has his finger on the pulse here, and I'm going to expound and expand and emphasize that. The rational mind would say absolutely no to Joseph Smith from this point on. Now, the rational mind should have said no to Joseph Smith a lot, lot, lot earlier, and I will get into videos on why. But here on polygamy, this is where the buck firmly stops with the rational mind. He was saying that any moral rule, any common sense limitation on any human constraint could be overthrown by a revelation. Here's the danger. Let me let Bushman continue. The assertion confirmed the fears of rational Christians for centuries about the social chaos inherited, inherent in revealed religion. Indeed, that is exactly right. That is why Christopher Hitchens was so poignantly powerful against Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Mormonism, all of them, because they all fall under this rubric of being fundamentally irrational. What I'm going to propose, I may as well do it now, is the irrationality, like I said in my short is that the revelation which they emphasize is very necessary for your exaltation, or you will be damned to hell, is how Joseph Smith told them. This was so necessary that God even sent an angel with the sword to threaten Joseph Smith's life, not caring about his free agency whatsoever. If he didn't begin living polygamy immediately, he had put it off for several months, if not several years. The angel came and forced him to it. So the Mormon apologetic that God is not supposed to reveal everything to us because it will take away our moral free agency, all of that is just mere eyewash and window dressing. It has absolutely no validity as an argument whatsoever. God doesn't give a flip about your free agency. Joseph Smith's life proves that. He claims he was forced. So the issue for me is... Why, if it is so necessary, if it is so vastly important, if it is the way to get to the 
third highest level of the third highest heaven, the celestial, which also has three levels, exactly like Emmanuel Swedenborg, one of Joseph Smith's contemporaries, also described the heavens. So there's that influence. If it is so important, if it is so necessary, if God loves his children so very, very much, if it is so important to God to help as many of his children be exalted in this manner, then it is fundamentally irrational, illogical, and ungodlike for God to only say that to one man and then let him tell everyone else, including the women. And if the women hesitated or they were so shocked they didn't know what to say, he would tell them, well, I will give you till the morning to come up with your answer. This will highly exalt you, but if you refuse it, then it will damn you. And he was telling the women that. Now, if it's that important, God truly should have done the correct thing and simply given that revelation to absolutely every single individual whom he wanted to practice the polygamy. The women should have been involved. The women should have been included. Instead of having Joseph Smith go behind closed doors and shut the doors, unlock them, and then start making advances on the women, such as he did with Orson Pratt's wife, Sarah Pratt, and who also stood up against him, and Nancy Rigdon, a 17-year-old girl, who refused him. Rather than all of that secrecy, that, that uh, behind-closed locked doors, etc., had God sincerely wanted to share his exaltation with all, he very easily could have told absolutely all of the women who were going to be involved with Joseph Smith, with Brigham Young, with Heber C. Kimball, with Orson Hyde, etc. And he and Hiram Smith later on got on board and was a polygamist. Joseph's brother. That revelation should have been given to all of them so that all of this lying, all of this manipulation, all of this secrecy and hush-hush, etc., all of that could have been avoided. In my mind, that simply points to the obvious fact that this is simply Joseph Smith. It's a man-made doctrine. There is no divine revelation to this whatsoever. You can tell by, with this restored history that the church has hidden from you using its lying, manipulative methods, uh, you need to wake up to that fact because they're still doing it right now today. Uh, they could have simply shown the revelation to everyone, and everyone would have said, oh, glory, yes, let's do this, and it would have been properly done. The way it was done now, the way Joseph Smith did it, is absolutely ridiculous. Let's keep reading. Joseph quickly qualified what he had said. Although everything that God gives us is lawful and right, and tis proper that we should enjoy his gifts and blessings whenever and whenever he is disposed to bestow them, casual liaisons were not authorized. And yet that's what this heinous freak was involved in. But you notice he doesn't let anyone else do so. When John C. Bennett began doing it, saying this is what Joseph Smith taught, Joseph Smith came unhinged, right? Yeah. Don't do what I do. Do what I say. Yeah, right? Pure hypocrisy. Joseph continues, a gift taken was not a gift given. Blessings and enjoyments taken arbitrarily, without law, without revelation, without commandment, those blessings and enjoyments would prove cursings and vexations in the end, as they did. It cost Joseph Smith his life. Thank God. It would have been a horror had he made it to Utah, wouldn't it? As it was, his successor, Brigham Young, became the head or dictator, and he outdid Joseph Smith on the polygamy issue. <laughs> Crazy people. 
We should have to go down in sorrow and wailings of everlasting regret. See, Joseph Smith gets to set the tone. Joseph Smith gets to set the bar. Joseph Smith gets to decide who even gets to try to get over the bar, to be exalted. He gets to select and choose. He has to do so secretly. Some will, some won't. It's all just arbitrary male bias. And one of the descriptions of Joseph Smith's uh, attempt to seduce sexually an already married woman, one of his own Quorum of the Twelve Apostles' wife, Sarah Pratt, was that she was a very buxom, beautiful woman. Now, why is that description there? Unless, of course, we know where Joseph Smith's eyes were, not up in the celestial glories of high spirituality. No, he had a heart on, and he needed to solve his problem. That was how he handled that. And it blew up in his face. Here is the key statement by Richard Bushman that I think is incredibly interesting. Joseph Smith's, in Joseph Smith's mind, revelation functioned like law. The revelations came as commandments. The name he gave to all the early revelations, they required obedience. Once again, this is why if God actually was behind this, and he wasn't, he would have given that commandment the same to each and every single individual, man and woman. And then they all would have seen eye to eye, and it would have gone just beautifully, perfectly smooth. When it comes from a single man, and it only blesses and benefits that single man, you can take it to the bank, just not the Kirtland Bank. You can take it to the bank that it's a man-made doctrine for his benefit and satisfaction. Because as Todd Compton has so powerfully shown in Sacred Loneliness, his book on Joseph Smith's polygamy, demonstrating dozens and dozens of Joseph Smith's wives, and he gives the full biography of absolutely every one of them. It was a disaster for their comfort. It was a disaster for their peace of mind. It completely turned their lives topsy-turvy. It brought no happiness to anyone. And Joseph Smith had to lie and connive and try to smear everyone's reputation who rebuffed him, which he did. He did with Sarah Pratt. He did with Nancy Rigdon, etc., and so we do not see a praise to the man communing with Jehovah. We see a sniveling uh, brat of a spoiled, rotten, horny man whose own wife couldn't satisfy him. So he went after everybody else he could under the pretext and pretense of being a prophet when he was a seducer. And he introduced polygamy secretly and quietly. Then in Van Wagner's Mormon Polygamy of History, this is an incredibly powerful book on the issue of Mormon polygamy. I'm on page 30 here. Wagner says something interesting. When Sarah told her husband, Orson, of Smith's... Oh, before I do that, hold on. Here we go. Let, let me start on page 29. This is a... See, this is the historical context. See, the John C. Bennett story, John C. Bennett exposed Joseph Smith's polygamy, and that's what got Joseph Smith so furious. That's why he went and destroyed the printing press. The Nauvoo Expositor that Joseph Smith destroyed the printing press of them printing that Nauvoo Expositor, it didn't tell any lies. 
I was raised to believe that was just a newspaper from his enemies who just made all kinds of stuff up. It actually wasn't. When you read it, it simply told the truth that Joseph Smith was immorally hiding himself. This is a very important point. The Mormon's psychology had deceived me for decades, and I didn't get out of that until just recently, and I'm very grateful for the further light and knowledge that Father promised. The Bennett story further related that shortly after Smith's admission of affection towards Sarah Pratt, Smith and Bennett allegedly went to Sarah's house with some of the doctors sewing in the course of the visit. Smith reportedly said this, Sister Pratt, the Lord has given you to me as one of my spiritual wives. I have the blessing of Jacob granted me as he granted holy men of old, and I have long looked upon you with fear favor and hope you will not deny me. Sarah Pratt, who was more manly than Joseph Smith ever was, simply said, I care not for the blessings of Jacob. The feisty Sarah had said to have replied, I have one good husband, and that is enough for me. So, after another attempt by Smith to convince her of the correctness of polygamy, she reportedly told him, Joseph, if you ever attempt anything of the kind with me again, I will make a full disclosure to Mr. Pratt on his return home. And this was Joseph Smith's immature reply. Sister Pratt, Smith is said to have replied, I hope you will not expose me. If I am to suffer, all suffer, so do not expose me. You notice how Joseph Smith has manipulated everything so that he is virtually untouchable, and therefore, since he has absolute power, he is becoming absolutely corrupt by that power. He manipulates everyone around him in every single issue, whether it's moral, historical, financial. I mean, has anything changed in Mormonism since Joseph Smith's day? We see the same silly issues being repeated again by the Mormon church today, only on a much larger scale. This is a really important point. Will you agree not to expose me? If you will never insult me again, Sarah encountered, I will not expose you unless strong circumstances require it. If you should tell Bennett, said Joseph, I will ruin your reputation. Remember that. And he tried to. He did. Then, of course, this is what upset Orson Pratt so much, and they excommunicated him for it and all that. But here's uh, here's something else. When Sarah did tell Orson Pratt because of John C. Bennett's stories being published in the other newspapers, and then Orson coming to his wife and saying, what is going on here? And so she had to tell him. Bennett reported in his 15th July account that Pratt became enraged and told Smith never to offer an insult of the like again. Though full details of the confrontation are unknown between the two, subsequent events indicate that Smith not only denied Sarah's account, but accused her of being Bennett's paramour. So here he is spreading gossip and bearing false witness against his neighbor, his own apostle's wife. And this is supposed to be a spiritual man, right? This is supposed to be the man we're all supposed to believe in and just doggone near worship, right? Not me. A veiled reference to this accusation against Bennett may be evident in a harsh 22nd July Times and Season article. The paper charged that though Bennett professed to be virtuous and chaste, yet he did pierce the heart of the innocent, introduce misery and infamy into families, reveled in voluptuousness and crime, and led the youth that he had influence over to tread in his unhallowed steps. He professed to fear God, yet did he desecrate his name and prostitute his authority to the most unhallowed and diabolical purposes, even to the defiling of his neighbor's bed. 
And everything Joseph Smith accused Bennett of, he himself had done already. And this was the effect of this supposed divine revelation, but only to just one man, not everyone who was going to be involved. That's why we know it's a man-made doctrine. God had nothing to do with this. And then later on, page 31, I'm going to skip and jump a little bit because I don't have the time. Uh, Pratt stood by his wife. Now, Brigham Young, um, while Nauvoo and the surrounding area, of course, was obviously buzzing with rumors like crazy about the Pratts, Pratt stuck with his wife, and Brigham Young said that during this period, he and other members of the quorum labored constantly with Elder Orson Pratt, whose mind became so darkened by the influence and statements of his wife. This is victim-blaming. It is not Orson Pratt's mind that became darkened. It is Joseph Smith and Brigham Young's who were attempting to sin and then cover up their sins and smear and malign everyone else. And it is this part of the history that Mormonism today still doesn't want you to know about because they have taken it out. They don't wish to emphasize the reality and the effects. Joseph Smith did not die a martyr. Joseph Smith died a justified sinner's death. That's what I'm trying to get to, to make a long story short, and all of the evidence points to that. According to Young, Joseph told him that if Orson Pratt did believe his wife and follow her suggestions, he would go to hell. Guess where Joseph is? Everything he accused everyone else of, he himself was guilty of. So if the effects of that are to put them in hell, that's right where he had to go. It's almost like he prophesied his own eternal destiny, right? And so again, the Lord was, oh, and this is so crazy. According to Robinson now, Nancy Rigdon inquired of the messenger what was wanting, and, and they said Smith. They came to Nancy's door, and so Smith went into the room behind closed door, and he locked himself in with Nancy. And the Lord was well pleased with this matter of me asking you to be my wife. And this is Nancy Rigdon, the 17-year-old daughter of Sidney Rigdon, a member of Joseph Smith's first quorum of the presidency in the church. I mean, this bastard knows no bounds, does he? What a sick. Okay, so the Lord was well pleased with this matter of you being married to me, for he had got a revelation on the subject. You notice the pattern here. And God had given him all the blessings of Jacob. You notice the pattern here. And that there was no sin in it, whatever. And Nancy Rigdon basically said, Joseph, shut up and let me out or I'm going to beat the snot out of you with my umbrella. What she actually said is, I'm going to scream like crazy so all the neighbors show up. She said, there is no way ever I'm going to marry you, right? There's your hero for saying no to a heinous man. There's your hero. Not Joseph Smith, not the man who communed with Jehovah. See, that song is all brainwashing, pap and pablum also. Now, when he was finally confronted by Sidney Rigdon, the dad, and he was livid, and he said, Joseph, get your butt into my house, and you better not hesitate. And he wanted to know what was going on. At first, of course, of course, Joseph declared his innocence, right? That's the pattern. Deny, lie, lie, cray. No, no, me? A prophet. Oh, don't believe your daughter. I'm the prophet. 
she's the one that's lying. Well, eventually it came about to where, you know what, uh, you know what Nancy Rigdon said? He came up and she said, Joseph Smith, she looked him right in the eye. She said, Joseph Smith, you are telling that which is not true. And you did make such a proposition to me. And you know it. Now, in the original, that's crossed out. Conveniently, of course. Because, see, the church wants you to think that, no, 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 no. Joseph Smith never did anything wrong. So, the woman who was there with Joseph Smith talked to one of his plural wives so that she could describe to Nancy, yes, at first this is shocking, but oh, what a glorious spiritual thing this has been for me personally. Of course, she was full of it. She was just saying that because she was terrified of losing her blessings from Joseph Smith. You notice who has the power to give and remove the blessings? You notice what the blessings are predicated upon? Your own personal greatness? This is just an appeal to pure ego. That's what this is. That's Mormonism in a nutshell. And so she said, Nancy? Are you not afraid to call the Lord's anointed a cursed liar? And Nancy said, No, I am not, for he does lie, and he knows it. And then Joseph Smith had to confess and ask for forgiveness. That little girl is the hero for standing up to even the, quote, Lord's anointed. How many times have we heard that today in our lifetime about the so-called Lord's anointed down in Salt Lake City? Yeah? Well, I'm saying no to them, just like I would have Joseph Smith, because of this whole approach and attitude to, way, to where they, uh, yes, and later on, and this is on page, this is Wagner, Richard S. Van Wagner's book, Mormon Polygamy, on page 34, I want to read the after effects. After Joseph Smith had very justifiably been shot dead in Carthage jail for all of his ridiculous stupidity, um, years later, when totally disaffected from Mormonism, Sarah Pratt gave her account of the Goddard incident. She claimed that when she confronted Mrs. Goddard about her public accusations, Mrs. Goddard was goaded into accusing Sarah Pratt of being a whore and a bitch and a slut and a slime ball. And she wanted to have sex with every man on the street, etc. And it really did destroy Sarah Pratt. They, they stopped at nothing vile at all to smear anybody who dared say no to Joseph Smith. That's what happened. When she confronted her, here's what the woman who smeared Sarah Pratt said. She began to sob. It is not my fault, she said. Hiram Smith, the prophet's brother, came to our house with the affidavits all written out and forced us to sign them, saying you were a loose woman, a slut, and a little nanny boo-hoo. And Joseph and the church must be saved. And so they could sin all they wanted against their neighbors for one reason, to save Joseph Smith so that he could continue being the ass and continue breaking the law and continue raping women's virtues away from them through his redemption ridiculously unbiblical doctrine of polygamy. Now, it's really interesting that he put that back to Abraham, and then, of course, the justification is, well, we are doing the works of Abraham. When you read the biblical record, Joseph Smith said God commanded Abraham to take another wife. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> Doesn't fly. It's not in the Greek Septuagint. 
It is not in the Hebrew Masoretic text. It is not in any English translation. God never commanded Abraham to practice polygamy. That's Joseph Smith putting words in God's mouth. Has this maladroit no shame? Because it wasn't God that gave Abraham his plural wife. It was his maiden who did it. God had nothing to do with it. It's fascinating that nobody bothered to look that up, isn't it? It's fascinating that the church today still continues to pretend Doctrine and Covenants 132 was a genuine revelation from God Almighty, when in fact it's simply Joseph Smith making stuff up because he couldn't keep his own pecker in his pants. That's the reality. And it didn't matter whether they were 14-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 22-year-olds, 67-year-olds. He would send their husbands on missions across the ocean into Great Britain. And then he would propose to the mothers and the daughters and build up a whole spiritual wife system. I believe Compton has found 32 of them. And another fabulous reference is uh, George D. Smith. Mormon polygamy, but we called it celestial marriage, an absolute rocking, stunning, thick, huge 700-page historical text that the church has kept hidden from you and I all of our lives. And then finally, the excellent Richard S. Van Wagner again, a uh, biography of Sidney Rigdon, a man of religious excess, very superb, and, and the description of the Nazi uh, rigged in affair. And of course, the very famous Fawn Brody, No Man Knows My History, The Life of Joseph Smith, where she describes it. And she got excommunicated for it. Any surprise? Because anybody who tells the truth about the Mormon history gets excommunicated, or at least they used to. Now in the age of the internet, information is so far and wide that all the church can lamely do is say, well, brethren and sisters, we would like you to stick with church-approved sources. Can I translate that? Brothers and sisters, we would like you to remain brainwashed with our whitewashed history. Don't believe those people just because they're adding in the warts. This is not a wart. This is a crime and a sin against women, against human nature. It is sexual perversion and seduction of underaged girls who were just a little bit before age 15, as the church essay so ridiculously calls, says it. So... This is my beef with this whole theme using Nancy Rigdon as my hero, is that nothing is righteous about this. There, there can't possibly be anything spiritually confirming to the souls of everyone, William Clayton, to the contrary, that polygamy was a true celestial principle, and the Holy Ghost has borne testimony in my heart and soul that the only way you may become a god is with 229 of those little babes coming and washing all your clothes and dishes and making sure you be satisfied. It's just not right. It's not righteous. And it certainly isn't a revelation from God. God, if it was a big deal to him, certainly would have revealed it to all of those who would be involved. And when the time came where the pressure came on, when the government of the United States showed that it was much stronger than the Mormon priesthood brethren and began confiscating all their property, notice how they got them? They hit them in the wallet. Yeah, they started confiscating their property. Then Wilfred Woodruff gave what? Oh, a revelation. Well, we have to give this up. And then as Van Wagner has so skillfully shown time and time and time again, wherever I put his book on polygamy, they lied like crazy about that too and continued practicing polygamy for another dozen years. Nothing is faithful and true 
in Mormon history. That's why they hid it. That's why they would not want to tell you. That's why they whitewashed it. Because the truth shows you that none of them are true prophets. They're just men who manipulate and want power. And they get that power from your money. And it's only for this life. Regardless of what they say, they have no power over you when you say, like Nancy Rigdon and Sarah Pratt, no. So thanks for watching my Backyard Professor videos. I will have a bunch more of these out coming soon, and I will keep producing more on the Mormon history, the doctrine, the psychology, the philosophy, and the ridiculousness. Have a great day.